I mean, in reading this book, one of the, um, the one of the unexpected things I learned was that um, we probably spend too much time differentiating among endurance tasks, as opposed to wondering what they all have in common. You can look at a spectrum of different activities, whether it's you know, cognitive activities or physical activities and whether they're short duration or long duration. And fundamentally, what a lot of things have in common is that you kind of have to hold your finger in the flame. You have to resist your, your impulse to, to pull it away or whatever your first impulse is. And, and I think that is kind of a unifying theme that, that brings together great athletes, great, uh, great performers in business and other contexts. And it's actually, you know, when you think about great athletes, we often think about physiological measurements, like who's got the biggest VO2 max, who's got the fastest 40 yard time. But you can actually do cognitive tests on great athletes and they are different than the rest of us. They, they can perform better on computerized tests of mental fatigue resistance. You know, I thought of that when I was listening to a, a podcast, uh, the Lance Armstrong podcast, Forward, and he had on a number of his former riding mates, the, several of his teammates from the glory years, and they were all talking, they were sort of reminiscing about what it was like to be on the Tour de France. And they started talking about these brutal climbs, you know, when the weather was freezing and they're, they're on the bike for, I forgot how many, a ridiculous number of hours climbing some massive mountain. There were several things that was fascinating. The first fascinating thing was how much they clearly enjoyed, not just the memory, but they enjoyed the experience of suffering in that way. And then they segued into this wonderful conversation about all of them had now had children. And their great anxiety as a parent is that they didn't know whether they would be able to pass along to instruct their children in the joys of suffering, which I thought was so fantastic. But it's sort of what, we're, what you're getting at, right? That the, there is something quite unique about the mindset of these endurance heroes. Yeah, you know, so I, I heard one researcher describe this as benign masochism, that maybe one of this, you know, we, we, we look for all the traits or the secrets or the ways that great athletes become great. And maybe one thing is that on some level, they enjoy hurting. And they don't enjoy ex extreme pain, but there's something about the feeling of, you know, you hear people talk about, you know, I, I felt alive during that moment. It was hard, but I felt alive. And I think I would bet, I don't know, I would bet that someday we'll be able to identify that some people are wired to enjoy pain a little bit. But I also think we can learn that a little bit. I, and I know for me, my, you know, my own, I, so I share a little bit of that anxiety about how do I teach my kids that it's okay to be uncomfortable, that it's actually, it can be a glorious thing to be uncomfortable. It's like, well, Okay, look back, Alex. As a 12-year-old, were you like, oh, I love to suffer, I'm a Spartan, stoic, yada, yada, yada. No, I was an ordinary kid. And through a combination of, of circumstance and opportunity, I, I got into running. And I didn't love running. Initially, I loved the idea that you could stop running. That's like the best part about it. And it was only, you know, over time that I learned to acquire a taste for it. So I think, uh, and I, I bet the same is true for these cyclists that, you know, they probably didn't like pain, you know, they probably weren't six-year-olds saying, you know, please let me stick my finger in the socket again, I just love to hurt. Mm -hmm. But you, you, it's, a, it's an acquired taste. Well, a couple of questions out of that. So my first assumption, one of the reasons that I would have had before I read your book would be the difference between a truly elite endurance athlete or performer of any kind and me is that um, they don't, they can achieve at levels without pain that I can't. In other words, that if I'm, if I compare myself to the greatest distance runner in the world, they're so fit that they can run near a world record time and not actually suffer the way I suffer. But what you're saying is something different, that not only are they better physiologically, but they also suffer but are fine with it. Yeah, this is one of the great debates, right? Like, Haley Gabriel Selassie ran a marathon in two hours. Joe Schmo ran a marathon in four hours. It doesn't that mean Joe Schmo is twice as tough as Haley Gabriel Selassie because he was out there for twice as long pushing his limits. And you know, th th there's lots of rabbit holes you can go down in that debate. But look, there's no doubt that the greatest athletes have uh, physical abilities that allow them to do things with ease that the rest of us can't. But I think an, an undersold part of it, part of that equation is, yeah, they either have learned to or are able to or have trained themselves to deal with pain. And I think 
I, you know, anyone who's trained for a sport for a long period of time ends up understanding that. Yeah, their body has gotten bigger, stronger, tougher, whatever. Uh, but they've also learned to go into that zone of discomfort and learned the difference between a warning sign and a stop sign. They've learned that if, if, you know, if you're breathing hard or if your legs are feeling heavy, that doesn't mean you're out of oxygen, you're about to die. It just means, you know, this isn't sustainable indefinitely, but you can ignore it. So I, I, I do think the great athletes, uh, they, they learn to tolerate. They, they, don't, they don't necessarily feel pain differently than the rest of us, but they frame it differently. It's information, and, and, and as a result, they can stay in that pain cave for longer. Now, do we, how good of an understanding do we have of that process? So you've suggested that some part of it might be a learned adaptation. Um, I'm assuming some part of that might also be just a, a straight up innate difference. Can we say with confidence that the act of continuously and over a long period of time testing the outer limits of your thresholds can raise your threshold for pain? Yeah, it, this is relatively recent stuff. Like, th there's a study that goes back to the 80s, early 80s, with, with swimmers, elite swimmers in Scotland, where they saw, they tested pain sensitivity. It's actually pretty uh, brutal. You, you know, you, you put a blood pressure cuff around your arm and you have to squeeze a, a contraction every second until you can't take it anymore. So it's, it's really pushed to the limits and it gets very painful. So they found that pain tolerance ebbed and flowed with the competitive season. So they were able to, not just were they able to swim better in the middle of their competitive season, they were able to tolerate more ischemic pain, it's called, when they were preparing for a big race. And the lowest pain tolerance was after their off season. So even within elite athletes, it, it, it rises and falls. And more recently, there's been some studies where they, they, they show that you, if you take people and you train them physically, their, pain to, their tolerance to other kinds of pain. So it's not just within the sport, their, their generalized pain tolerance increases, and it increases specifically in proportion to how much they suffer in training. You can do different kinds of training that are more or less uncomfortable, but achieve the same physical changes. But if you're uncomfortable, you learn to tolerate pain. The mechanisms, it's, it's still up in the air, but the, the, the leading theory is that it's, it's basically psychological coping, coping mechanisms. You learn to reframe the pain or to distract yourself. It's just familiarity with, with discomfort.